Hello, I'm Denise, and I'm currently 35 years old. When I was just eight, I lost my mother, which led to my father raising me on his own. This went on for about 10 years until I was around 13. That's when my dad shared with me that he had started dating someone. At that age, I didn't really have strong feelings about it. However, when I was 14, my dad introduced me to his girlfriend, Margaret, and mentioned they were planning to marry. Margaret was significantly younger than I expected, being only a decade older than me. Initially, this age difference startled me a bit, but with time, it became less of an issue for me. Margaret and I didn't exactly click. She often tried too hard to act like a mother to me, which felt overwhelming. Despite my attempts to discuss this with my dad, he seemed to take Margaret's side. This didn't sit well with me, and my relationship with my dad remained strong. We would meet for lunch every other weekend. My dad sometimes tried to encourage a relationship between Margaret and me, but eventually he seemed to accept my feelings. Professionally, I was doing quite well. Straight after college, I landed a job at a reputable firm. Financially, I was neither wealthy nor struggling, living a comfortable life and managing to save. However, my world was shaken when I was 30 as my dad tragically passed away in an accident. Losing him was an enormous blow, leaving me to navigate profound grief. I struggled immensely, often crying myself to sleep and finding it hard to get through the day. Fortunately, I was able to take a week off work to grieve. Despite our strained relationship, I knew Margaret and my dad had shared a deep love, so I tried to check on her. The first time I saw her after the accident, she appeared surprisingly unaffected, at least outwardly. I, on the other hand, was visibly distressed, with puffy, dark-circled eyes and a blotchy complexion from constant crying. It struck me how different our grieving processes appeared to be, though I recognized it might seem judgmental to expect her to grieve in the same way. In the beginning, I secretly wished I wasn't the only one feeling such a profound sense of loss over my dad, who meant everything to me. This feeling slowly dissipated when Margaret and I had a heart-to-heart, -heart, as she tearfully reminisced about the wonderful person my dad was and how his absence left a void in our lives. It became clear to me that she too was grappling with grief. Following this conversation, I found myself visiting Margaret more frequently. Our meetings over tea became a space where we could openly share our emotions. It was refreshing to interact with her as herself, rather than in the role she had tried to fill as a mother figure. One day, during one of our talks, Margaret began sobbing uncontrollably. It caught me off guard because our discussion hadn't touched on anything particularly sad. I quickly moved to comfort her, letting her lean on me. Once she had settled a little, I gently inquired about what had upset her so much. Through her tears, she explained that she had received a worrying letter from the bank. She had been so engrossed in caring for my dad and handling his medical bills in the preceding months that she'd neglected the mortgage payments. Now, with the mortgage in her name and no job to her credit, she was facing the threat of homelessness. The bank had given her a five-month deadline to clear her dues, including the mortgage payments for those months. She was in a financial bind, with not enough money to meet the bank's demands, and my dad hadn't left her with sufficient funds to tide over such a crisis. Trying to soothe her, I reassured Margaret that it wasn't the end of the world and that I was in a position to help her out. Surprised and grateful, she listened as I proposed my conditions for the assistance. First, I explained that it wasn't feasible for me to both rent my place and cover her mortgage, so I would need to move in with her. She immediately agreed, affirming that the house was as much mine as hers. Secondly, I made it clear that this arrangement couldn't be permanent. I would help with the mortgage for now, but she needed to find employment soon to take over its payments. I was willing to contribute to half of the mortgage to ease the transition. Margaret agreed to these terms, deeply thankful for the support. Through this ordeal, we found a new understanding and appreciation for each other, brought together by our mutual love for my dad and our shared commitment to honoring his memory. However, I emphasize that Margaret would need to secure employment and over time, reimburse me for the financial help I was offering. She assured me she would. Understanding the immense transition from financial security to uncertainty evoked my empathy towards her. The anxiety and stress she must have been feeling were unimaginable, but thankfully, I was in a position to assist, thanks to a principle my dad instilled in me. The importance of maintaining a robust savings account for unforeseen challenges. Within the following week, I reached out to Margaret's bank to negotiate the mortgage payments and prevent the foreclosure. Margaret had missed five months of payments, which, along with late and pre-foreclosure fees, amounted to approximately $220,000.
It was a significant sum, even from my savings, but it was necessary to prevent Margaret from losing her home. Her gratitude was palpable. She even prepared a lavish feast as a gesture of thanks, showcasing a humility I hadn't seen in her before. I reminded her, though, of the importance of beginning her job hunt promptly, a process she assured me had already commenced. Moving in with Margaret marked a new chapter. Living together again was an interesting adjustment. Margaret had become more particular about the cleanliness of the house than I remembered, a trait I didn't mind except when it came to my personal space. I stood my ground regarding the state of my room, advocating for mutual respect for our individual preferences, especially since my financial contribution was a significant reason we were able to maintain this living arrangement. Despite occasional minor disagreements, cohabitation was largely positive. As time passed, transitioning from weeks to months and months into years, my patience began to wear thin with Margaret's prolonged job search. She consistently assured me she was looking for employment, yet progress seemed stagnant. Despite my support, I noticed no progress in Margaret's job search. It struck me as odd that she hadn't even mentioned going for an interview. When I gently broached the subject, she quickly became defensive. I explained that my concern wasn't with her efforts, but with the lack of tangible results, especially since a year had passed since she promised to find a job. I suggested even part-time work as a temporary solution, but she dismissed the idea, suggesting she'd rather face homelessness than accept a job she deemed beneath her. This response, especially her using my dad's memory to guilt me, felt manipulative. I continued to cover the mortgage, but Margaret's behavior grew increasingly difficult to handle. She started questioning my whereabouts and who I spent time with, imposing more than I felt was fair. Initially, I tolerated her behavior, but as it escalated, I asserted my boundaries, which led to tension between us. After another two years passed with no change, my patience wore thin. Doubting Margaret's sincerity in finding employment, I took the controversial step of looking through her emails. What I found confirmed my suspicions. She had applied to only two jobs in the three years since I started helping with the mortgage. I felt betrayed by her deceit, especially after I had gone to great lengths to support her, confronting Margaret about my discovery. And the decision to stop financial assistance led to a heated argument. She reacted poorly, failing to understand the gravity of her actions and my frustration. This moment was a turning point forcing me to reassess our living situation and the sustainability of our current arrangement. For three years, I extended every possible support to Margaret, offering guidance and patience as she navigated her challenges. However, her reluctance to accept advice or actively seek employment led me to confront her about her apparent lack of effort. When I asked her to prove her job search efforts, she accused me of invading her privacy. Despite this, I expressed how our relationship had grown and my gratitude for the opportunity to help her, but I also emphasized my need to focus on my own future goals, which did not include indefinitely paying for a home that was never in my plans. Margaret's distress was palpable, and though it affected me, I needed space to process my frustration. During this time, I considered how I could assist Margaret in a way that would also allow me to move forward. After some research, I suggested she consider filing for bankruptcy as a way to manage her mortgage payments and potentially relieve her financial burden for up to six years. Initially hesitant, Margaret eventually opened up to the idea and I committed to helping her with the process. It took weeks, but we successfully navigated the paperwork and Margaret was granted a reprieve from her mortgage payments. With this newfound relief, I urged Margaret to focus on rebuilding her life. Her response, though cold, indicated she believed she could manage on her own. This realization that our relationship had shifted from mutual support to dependency prompted me to make a significant change. I moved out the following month, focusing on my personal and professional growth. My finances improved, I earned a promotion, and I began making substantial investments. As time passed, the distance between Margaret and me grew. We barely communicated and it became clear that the effort to maintain our connection was one-sided. This chapter of my life, while challenging, taught me the importance of setting boundaries and prioritizing my well-being alongside my willingness to help others. Despite everything, I made an effort to check in on Margaret from time to time because she was important to my dad and he loved her deeply. Whenever I inquired about her well-being 
Or if she had found work, she responded dismissively, telling me it was none of my business. Her coldness stung, but over time, I learned to let it slide, focusing instead on the positive trajectory of my own life. However, about six months after Margaret's bankruptcy relief ended, she unexpectedly appeared at my doorstep, looking visibly distressed. Her disheveled appearance and evident weight loss signaled she was facing severe hardships. Despite anticipating a request for help and mentally preparing to refuse, I couldn't ignore her plight and invited her in to talk. Margaret confessed to spiraling into deep loneliness and depression after I moved out, expressing regret for pushing me away during her moments of anger. She explained her anger was directed not only towards herself and the loneliness she felt, but also towards my dad for leaving her in such a state, and the frustration of her ongoing struggles, including a five-year-long unsuccessful job hunt. Hearing Margaret's admission of her severe depression and financial desperation, including the dwindling of the funds my dad left her and her family's lack of support, left me in a difficult position. Though I had firmly decided against further financial assistance, the sight of someone so close to the edge of despair, someone my dad had cared for, made it challenging to maintain that resolve. I understood all too well how debilitating depression could be, and found myself torn between my determination to uphold my boundaries and the empathy I felt for a person in the throes of such a profound struggle. My empathy quickly turned into action, as I assured Margaret I would extend my help once more. Her tears and heartfelt thanks warmed me, reinforcing my belief in supporting those in need. The following week found me back at the bank, navigating the complexities of Margaret's mortgage, which had been neglected for six months. I couldn't help but wonder why she hadn't considered adjusting her mortgage to more manageable payments. However, considering her overwhelmed state, I chalked it up to her inability to deal with the situation. Upon reviewing her mortgage details, I discovered she was $92,000 short of fully settling her debt, including late fees. My financial situation has improved significantly over the past six years, allowing me the capability to cover this amount. When I proposed directly paying off her mortgage with the understanding she would repay me over time, Margaret was moved to tears. She eagerly agreed, promising repayment. I planned to formalize this agreement in writing, but somehow Margaret persuaded me to prioritize settling her debt before drafting any contract. After paying off her loan, I visited her home, only to be greeted by a scene that unsettled me deeply. An unknown car was in the driveway, and inside, the sound of Margaret's laughter intertwined with a man's voice filled the air. Entering the living room, I was confronted with the sight of Margaret comfortably seated on another man's lap, a stark contrast to the grief-stricken widow who had spoken so fondly of my father just a week prior. This display of affection, so soon after her declarations of undying love for my dad and the emotional appeals, that had led me to assist her financial eye felt like a betrayal. Reflecting on her earlier words, I realized they might have been a calculated attempt to manipulate my feelings, leveraging my love for my dad to coax me into paying off her loan. The realization struck hard when Margaret, noticing my presence, pointed me out to her companion with a laugh, introducing me in a manner that felt dismissive and exploitative. This moment crystallized the manipulation I had overlooked prompting me to reconsider the nature of my support and the boundaries I had allowed to be crossed. During an unexpected and unsettling visit, Margaret gloated to her companion about how she had cunningly manipulated me into paying off the house's mortgage, a property she acquired through my father. She admitted to feigning helplessness to secure my financial assistance, revealing her true colors and intentions. Her lack of genuine affection for my father and her exploitation of our relationship for financial gain was blatantly admitted. Stunned by her callousness and deceit, I confronted her only to be met with a shocking lack of remorse. She prudently declared her victory, boasting about owning the house and her new life with her boyfriend, utterly dismissing the love my father had for her. Feeling betrayed and hurt, I left her house in tears, determined not to let her triumph in her deceit. Fortunately, I had a moment of providence, the bank had a policy of holding large transactions for a day, allowing me the chance to cancel the transfer upon realizing Margaret's deceit. I promptly canceled the payment, cutting off all contact with her, ensuring she could not reach me again. As days turned into weeks, Margaret remained oblivious to the canceled transaction, living under the false assumption that she had secured the house. Meanwhile, I moved on, both physically and emotionally, taking solace in the knowledge that her treachery would soon come to light. True to expectations, the mortgage payment was never completed, leading to the foreclosure of the house. 
Word of her situation spread among mutual friends, revealing her true nature to all and isolating her further as her boyfriend left and she found herself without support, income, or a roof over her head. This painful experience taught me the harsh reality of human nature and the importance of guarding my emotions against manipulation. I learned the hard lesson that not everyone deserves my trust or my help, especially those who see kindness as a weakness to be exploited. In spite of the turmoil, I found strength in my ability to protect my father's legacy and stand up for myself. This ordeal, while bitter, has not embittered me. Instead, it has empowered me to live a life that honors my father's memory, free from the shadows of the past.